Fighting is intensifying day by day, especially in the country's capital of Damascus, where activists say military has deployed tanks and helicopters. Meanwhile, the U.N. has until Friday to renew the mandate for observers in Syria, and Western nations want Russia to back tougher measures to stop the fighting in Syria. But Russia appears resistant to Western calls for the country to increase pressure on Bashar al-Assad of Syria. This week, United Nations envoy Kofi Annan will be in Moscow to promote his peace plan for Syria and will meet with President Vladimir Putin today. We're talking more about the violence there with Dr. Hisham Ahmed. He's professor of politics at St. Mary's College of California, and he joins me on the line from Palestine. Dr. Hisham Ahmed, welcome. Always a pleasure to be with you, Jessica. Or welcome back. We've had you on the show several times and talking about how this has all developed over such a long expanse of time in Syria. And now we're hearing that rebel forces say they've launched an all-out assault on the capital of Damascus in Syria, calling it Operation Damascus Volcano. To what extent are the rebels at this point better equipped and even more organized to confront the military of Syria? Well, first, uh, Jessica, you know, let me uh, state perhaps the obvious that this has been a very, very tragic situation. Uh, the bloodshed has gone on for months uh, nonstop. So many people, innocent people, have been uh, getting killed. There is a real tragedy unfolding in Syria, and indeed this ought to be another reminder for all concerned within Syria and in the international community to do their utmost to put an end to this calamitous uh, situation. Uh, secondly, it was a well-known fact that the opposition had its own problems of dispersal and fragmentation, but I believe with time they have been able to muster more organization and more support from within and outside of Syria. Therefore, I believe that their ability to effectuate some change is becoming uh, more obvious uh, by the day. In the process, however, the government of Syria, the regime, is becoming, of course, more entrenched in its attempt to quell the rebellion and to try to drive wedges within the opposition forces, both militarily and uh, politically. Unfortunately, the ones who are caught in the middle are the simple average uh, innocent uh, Syrians. Almost every week we hear about a massacre, a slaughter here and a slaughter there. So many children uh, men and uh, women uh, really get caught uh, in between uh, these uh, fighting forces. And I believe, uh, for all observers, it has become abundantly clear that, that the security uh, option uh, on the part of the regime, as well as on the part of the opposition, uh, has lost its course. It is hard to uh, envisage uh, a winner uh, out of this uh, fighting, hence really the call and the need for an effective, serious political process backed up by all concerned. Short of doing this, I'm really afraid that uh, two things will emanate, two results will happen, uh, Jessica. Number one, the already uh, fragile uh, state regime, state system in Syria will further crumble, and if this were to happen, this will have a, an all-out effect serious fallout uh, regionally. It will impact uh, other uh, neighboring states, uh, whether in Lebanon, Turkey, uh, Israel, uh, or even others. That is, a uh, dismantled uh, Syrian system could really result in uh, anarchy, could result in chaos. Uh, nobody can guarantee then uh, what would happen to the components of power, where would they go, who would acquire them, and so on and so forth. So that would be the first result. The second result, if this fighting goes on, is for uh, Syria to be balkanized, to be Lebanonized, to have more divisions, more fightings within the center and on the periphery. And it would become, uh, I believe, an attractive place uh, for all those who might be interested in arms sale and what have you. Uh, in the process, uh, this could, this could uh, delve more blows and more devastation to Syrian society. Uh, the situation is serious. The situation cannot really tolerate any more suspension or delay of a serious diplomatic effort, and therefore all concerned should really see to it that this tragedy is brought to a halt once and for all. So you're saying we could possibly, would you even compare this situation to what happened in Mali, where we saw the president um, basically leave power, and now there's this huge vacuum, power vacuum, uh, where there is no one in charge. Is that what you're saying could possibly happen in Syria if we did see this regime crumble? 
Absolutely. That is definitely one of the scenarios, one of the possibilities. That is the replication of the Mali situation. It could also be the replication of the Iraqi situation, although maybe on a more accelerated basis. Uh, we saw that when Iraq as a state crumbled, that had opened the door for all uh, kinds of groups, uh, Al-Qaeda uh, and others, uh, to step in and each to try to assert and reassert itself in its own way and for its own purposes. The end result, of course, was that so much killing took place, so much fighting continued to take place. Syria has a more sensitive geopolitical location and situation than all the examples we have even mentioned. I can also think of a weakened state in Libya, as good as the removal of Gaddafi was for all concerned, domestically, uh, regionally, and internationally. Uh, nonetheless, there are certain safety valves which one has to take into account to think about when we bring or when change is introduced in a state like Syria. And this is why a transitional period will have to be introduced. A diplomatic course will have to be also pursued uh, seriously and vigorously. Thus far, unfortunately, it is hard to think of any party to this conflict, whether the regime or the opposition, who have been, uh, who are interested in seeing to it that the Kofi Annan mission, for example, succeeds. It, it, it seems to be the case that all those parties from the start, even before the mission was launched, had doomed it to failure. And that's a pity. That's, uh, that's quite tragic, because that means that there was almost a total refusal to uh, let the diplomatic uh, process to, to, to have its place, uh, to be pursued. And I believe this has contributed to the worsening of the situation rather than for an introducing, uh, introducing a solution to this, uh, to this conflict. Uh, thus, since the Kofi Annan mission is still there, as troubled as it might be, and as impregnated with challenges and with obstacles, nonetheless, in my view, it is perhaps the best course of action at this stage in time, given such calamitous situation, to see to it that the conflict is brought to a halt, and then the process of political change can be pursued and introduced. Well, Kofi Annan will be in Moscow this week, actually meeting with President Vladimir Putin today. But Russia, as we mentioned earlier, has continued to take this stance that it does not really want to get involved uh, at this point. Could we see that change this week, do you believe, with Kofi Annan meeting with officials in Moscow? Well, I, I really hope so. I, I really hope so. It is obvious that the Syrian situation has created some polarization in the international system and in the international community. We all remember the bubble Chinese and Russian veto uh, with regard to Syria. After all, <laughs> there is no even-handedness, uh, you know, on the part of uh, Western powers with regard to conflicts in the region. It is true that there are massacres, there is killing in Syria, which needs to be dealt with. But even-handedness also dictates that other situations be uh, considered. I mean, the plight of the Palestinian people, uh, there are so many other problems that the West doesn't really tune to. Uh, this is not to justify the Russian and uh, Chinese uh, double veto, but this is to suggest that given that uh, uh, double standard on the part of the uh, West, uh, I believe that has opened the door for other powers to try to step in. I believe the critical uh, point for Russia and for China in this regard was the way the Libyan situation was handled. Uh, there was an authorization by the United Nations for NATO to sustain a no-fly zone for, uh, Libyan, for the Libyan Air Force, but it is clear that uh, NATO has gone beyond that, and therefore that has, I believe, upset Russian and Chinese uh, politicians, uh, hence perhaps uh, triggering this bubble veto in the United Nations Security Council regarding Syria. Now, with uh, this continued effort on the part of Kofi Annan, uh, I believe, yes, he might be able indeed uh, to carve up, to work out some diplomatic understandings with the uh, Russian uh, leadership. Uh, but you know, there are other corners where diplomacy has to be truly uh, embraced, uh, and that is on the part of the countries that back up some of the oppositional groups. And here I'm referring to some regional powers in the Arab world, uh, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and so on and so forth, and internationally, that is, 
the French, the United States, and the British. There has to be some room allowed for serious diplomacy. Well, and this week we have Syria's former ambassador to Iraq coming out and saying that, well, he defected, uh, but he, now he's coming out and saying that the major bombings across Syria had been orchestrated by the government in collaboration with al-Qaeda. To what extent do you believe that that is true, and will that work to also put pressure on Russia to step in and take a different stance regarding Syria? Well, the defection, of course, on the part of the Syrian ambassador in, in Baghdad is understandable. I mean, after all, you know, there is so much anger. There is so much, there, there is so much frustration with the killing that is taking place. And, uh, yes, it is to be expected that more defections uh, would take place within, you know, the political circles and within the military. However, I believe one cannot confuse the issues. Uh, Al-Qaeda is one thing, and the Syrian regime is an entirely different thing. And as a matter of fact, uh, weakening the Syrian regime, as brutal as it is, uh, could uh, lead to the strengthening of Al-Qaeda. Uh, Al-Qaeda is the kind of organization that thrives, that um, uh, 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 in a way strengthens itself and its strength when there is anarchy and chaos. That is the most appropriate environment for uh, Al-Qaeda to become active. And I think we did see an interesting correlation when the state system in Iraq was weakened. Iraq was the only country in the Arab world that had no uh, basis whatsoever for Al-Qaeda. Uh, but with the weakening of the state system in Iraq, Al-Qaeda managed to step in and rather to turn Iraq into uh, you know, some of its headquarters and hotbeds. I do see a similar situation developing in Syria if we end up with more anarchy and chaos. So as a matter of fact, while I do understand the defection, and while I think it is uh, perfectly sound, but uh, one cannot confuse the issue and consider the Syrian regime and al-Qaeda to be operating on the same wavelength. These are completely two different uh, political forces that are diametrically opposed to each other. And as a matter of fact, uh, there is a reverse argument that perhaps al-Qaeda is the kind of organization that has been involved in perpetrating some of the uh, you know, um, violent acts that we do in Syria, uh, do see in Syria here and there as well. But if we have a former official saying that the Syrian government is working with Al Qaeda, and now we have Red Cross coming out and saying this is a civil war, could we not see further action taken, even on the part by the U.S. to step in? Since this would be, would it not be a terrorist situation? You're absolutely, absolutely correct. <clears throat> what I should also mention, you know, that Al-Qaeda has become a rallying point for everybody, so to speak. That is, whenever uh, any party wants to see support being built up in uh, backing its own agenda, uh, it has to suggest that Al-Qaeda is working with this adversary. Interestingly enough, uh, the Syrian regime itself also came out repeatedly and said that many of the acts of violence in Damascus and around Damascus were carried out by al-Qaeda operatives. And actually, uh, uh, some US, U.S. officials have, on more than one occasion, kind of confirmed that there is a good degree of accuracy uh, to this assessment that al-Qaeda was involved in these acts of violence. Now we do see the reverse. Uh, uh, a former official, that is the amb former ambassador to Syria and Iraq, coming out saying that there is cooperation between Syria and Al-Qaeda, the Syrian regime and Al-Qaeda. And I think what he's trying to say, what he's trying to do, is to rally more uh, Western support against uh, the Syrian regime by suggesting that there is interconnectedness interconnect between the regime and Al-Qaeda. I personally, based on my you know, based on my study of uh, how these uh, organizations operate and work, I, I don't uh, see any room for uh, interconnectedness and coordination between the Syrian regime and uh, al-Qaeda. As a matter of fact, I do see the other way around. We've been speaking with Dr. Hisham Ahmed. Really appreciate you joining me, Dr. Ahmed. Uh, Dr. Ahmed is a professor of politics at St. Mary's College of California, and he joins me on the line from Palestine. We've been talking about the ongoing fighting and violence in Syria that is de intensifying day by day. Dr. Hisham Ahmed, thanks so much. Always a pleasure indeed, Jessica.